bicentennial lecture uh, given by our Vice President Ioannis Kokinidis. Uh, go on ahead, Ioannis, and please start. Thank you. Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ioannis Kokinidis. I have a, G I have a PhD in GIS and remote sensing. I'm not a historian, I have to admit that from the very start. So, uh, with this event we intended to actually have it three years ago when it was the actual 200 years from the Greek Revolution. Unfortunately, COVID-19 hit us, uh, so we've, we had to delay, but you know, the Greek Revolution lasted nine years. So, you know, we are in the bicentennial already. Now, for some of my generation, my formative event as a kid is the period known as uh, Dirty 89, uh, which was a very ugly period into Greek politics, 1989. You know, me being a kid, I said, you know, let's just read about something, some more glorious periods in Greek history, like the Greek Revolution. Especially since, you know, those things happened when I was in elementary school and we were taught the Greek element, in elementary school, we were taught the Greek Revolution in pretty heroic terms. So, I actually opened up, every, like every, every house in Greece, uh, we have the history of the Greek nation, which is uh, a multi-volume multi uh, book of Greek history published since 1975, 658 pages, and I actually started reading. And you know, it, they don't really teach us that great uh, the Greek Revolution when we are in elementary school. You see, during the Greek Revolution, yeah, we've got two civil wars. We've got the, the anarchy at the, at the end after the assassination of Kapodistrias. But this is also teaching that the Greek Revolution is something that you will study, that you need to study. You know, the Greek Revolution was not done by perfect people, our heroes. They were done by normal people they were, that were about, you know, as messed up as we are. And this is why we can study, because despite their problems, they were people that actually achieved greatness for in the Greek state. So, as I said, uh, 1975, the history of the Greek nation, that volume came out. That's basically our understanding of the Greek Revolution. Uh, around the by around the sesquicentennial. So what have we really what has been really been published in the meantime? Well, on the Greek side, uh, uh, we had the, the publication of um, of part of the memoirs of General Macrianis, Visions and Miracles. On the Greek side, to be honest, it's a pretty well explored subject. Now, on the other side, though, the archives. Britain, believe it or not, still keeps secret. The, the file on the assassination of Kapodistrias, which is of course a big mystery why. You know that they actually were behind it, we know that from the French archives. So why are they actually keeping secret? Lavrov, was you probably all know, is, was and is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, the Russian Federation. He, he, they had an event on March 25, 2021, and they said from now on, Anyone who wants to study the Greek Revolution, they're super welcome to come to St. Petersburg. And if they can read Russian, they can open up their temple, no longer limit any access. However, the big things that have not really been uh, uh, on, the, on the topic has been mostly the Turkish archives. Because on the one hand, Greek historians, for some reason, do not really read Turkish, how they actually get elected as uh, uh, as professors in the university without speaking Turkish, I have no idea. On the other hand, the Turks have not been super interested in actually writing stuff about how they actually, the war that they actually lost. So the major publication for the 200 years of the Greek Revolution is this one that I point here, uh, by Shukru Ilitsak, by Shukru Ilitsak, entitled Those Infidel Greeks, which is basically a publication and a uh, a translation of, uh, of Turkish archives on the Greek Revolution. And they do change somewhat the picture. You know, the archives show that, you know, the Greek Revolution was pretty bankrupt from the very beginning. They, uh, you know, so was the Ottoman Empire. It was also pretty bankrupt from the, at, the, at the end. So they had actually, the, those uh, at the end, especially during the Kapodistrian period, we do see 
For example, the Turks actually surrendering to the Greeks. How come? They had not been paid wages. And they said that they basically, when, they, when offered the possibility to go home, they just said, you know what, we'll accept it. So this has been the changes in the last 50 years on what we know. So, the point where I'll begin is the Byzantine Empire. We Greeks trace our, uh, our history from the Byzantine Empire. So we've got a pretty weird situation. Uh, in its historical purpose, the Byzantine Empire goes from the Byzantine epopeia, basically for in the space of a century, the empire defeating its enemies, even though they were at the peak of their power, to the Battle of Machikert, when we've had the, when the Turks first arrived in Asia Minor. Now Turks were nomads with an excellent cavalry, and that is why they were conquering. Now, after the Battle of uh, Magikert, eventually the Komnini dynasty did manage to start a, reco a recovery of the empire, but the, the, the Komnini were deposed. And then we have the great stab in the back, the Fourth Crusade. When the Crusaders took Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire were basically split into several statelets. Others led by Gre other Greek statelets, others were Latin. Where Latin in uh, Greek uh, in Greek terms usually means Italian maritime states, and others were Turkish states, more than one. Out of those, the Ottoman Empire eventually emerges the most as the dominant power, leading uh, and uh, the and uh, the threshold in history is the fall of Constantinople on Tuesday, May 29, 1453, which meant the end of the Byzantine Empire. So a few maps. So this is the Byzantine Empire at its middle peak under the Emperor Basil the Vulgaroctonos. Unfortunately, Basil the Vulgaroctonos, he never actually, he never married. He was eventually succeeded by his two nieces who were changing their husbands and the eventual emperors of the throne like shirts. So from this, we go to this after the Fourth Crusade. In, this is the Sultanate of Ram. The, in, uh, in red, these are Greek states. In purple, it's Latin states. And in green, it's Venice. 1400, the Ottoman Empire had mostly consolidated. And, uh, and uh, there were few statelets left. And by 1453, Constantinople fell. So the Ottoman Empire was founded in 1299. Originally, they were allies and mercenaries of the Byzantine Empire until they turned against it. It was temporarily destroyed by Tamerlane in 1402, but it recovered. Constantinople fell in 1453, by which point they conquered most of the Balkans and Asia Minor. The, after the Ottoman Mamluk War in 1516-17, they, they conquered most of the Middle and Near East. The, uh, they were checked at the Battle of Lepanto, when the United Christian fleet under the Spanish Prince Don Juan of Austria uh, stopped them. But then that particular alliance broke up. But the Battle of Lepanto is a major threshold. But they were pretty powerful. In the year 1627, a Turkish pirate actually raided Iceland. And because he couldn't find enough uh, loot to steal, he actually kidnapped something like 400 Icelanders and sold them to slavery in Morocco and Algeria. They were that powerful. But the turning point is the second siege of Vienna. There is the siege of Vienna that reached Vienna in 1683, and there they were stopped. From the year 1697, the Battle of Zenda, they were on the retreat. However, the reason why the Ottoman Empire lasted this long was in the end it became part of the European power structure. After, uh, after Prince Eugene of Austria defeated them in 1697, France actually declared war on Austria because they did not want Austria to become too powerful. They became part of the European uh, balance of powers. The other thing in Greece to note are the Ottoman-Venetian wars. After the Fourth Crusade, Venice controlled a very large part of Greece. And uh, Greece, it was not exactly peaceful. There were, there have, there were seven Ottoman-Venetian wars, out of which uh, Venice only won the sixth one. The rest it lost along with it its territory. So Greece did not see peace during the four centuries of Ottoman rule. 
So, in theory, the Ottoman Empire was composed of the four Miliet. The Turkish Miliet, the Greek Miliet, the Armenian Miliet, and the Jewish Miliet, in terms of relative power. Pretty theoretically, they were equal, but everybody knew that the Turkish Miliet, which was led by the Sultan, was the powerful one, and it dominated the rest. One of the ugliest episodes of the Ottoman Empire is the gathering of children to create the Janissary Corps. They would take Christian boys from the Balkans and Asia Minor at two phases, at the age of eight and at the age of twelve. And those that were taken at the age of eight, they would turn them into the Janissary Corps. Those that would take at the age of twelve, they were Janissaries, but they were administrators. So children, if they got, so the Christians, in order to save the children, they would actually, uh, even if they had the boy, they would tell them, you know, you're actually a girl. And then suddenly at the age of 10, they would tell them, you know, in reality, you're not a girl, you're a boy. They would marry them on the spot because married people were actually uh, removed from the, uh, from the gathering of children. Thankfully, that ended around 1700. But it's not like that the Christians had many rights on the Ottoman Empire. Any Muslim could test the sharpness of his sword on the neck of any Christian. Education was seen as a privilege rather than a right. That's why we had to increase the secret schools, where the children, the local village children, were educated by a semi-literate priest. And fine, however, compared to what was happening in uh, the Latin states, there was relative uh, tolerance for the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church was very. Are you hear me? Oh. The Orthodox Church was very seriously persecuted in Venetian territory. At least during, at least during the early bit, at least during the early. Excuse me. Give me a second. Yeah. All right. So, the Turks were tolerant, were more tolerant of the Orthodox Church. However, if you ask for equality, that's where tolerance ended. They didn't care what kind of subject you were, so long you were a subject to them. So, at the eve of the Greek Revolution, the Ottoman Empire had been declining since the second siege of Vienna, already two centuries in the past. We're also seeing at the end of the 18th century the mutinies of the Ayan. Ayan were basically powerful leaders in the Ottoman Empire who would collect the taxes and only give a small part uh, to the sublime port. They would turn to Constantinople. Uh, the two who are important for, our, for this history are Ali Pasha Tepelenli, and Muhammad Ali of Egypt. The rest by that point had been crushed, but that also meant that uh, the army controlled by the, the sublime port had been reduced in numbers. Now, the 18th century is the age of enlightenment. During the age of enlightenment, revolutionary liberal ideas uh, came out in the West, leading to both to the American and the French Revolution eventually. This has been diffused in Greece, too. The most important person in their diffusion was Rigas Ferreos, who actually called himself Rigas Velest Inglis. Rigas Ferreos was born in 1757, and when he was in his 20s, a Turk uh, forced him to cross a river and, and ride him like a donkey. He got annoyed, he threw him down in the middle of the river, and that Turk actually was drowned, and then he fled to the west. Uh, he moved to Vienna where he was a publisher, first published a romance novel. But the more important part about Rigas Ferreos was that he was the disseminator of the ideas of the French Revolution. He came up with the idea of a plan so that the Ottoman Empire, that the Sultan be replaced and it would be replaced by a French Revolution style, uh, have a French Revolution style revolution, where it would be a new state where everybody would be equal. However, he never, if he actually had an, a plan to, uh, he actually had a conspiracy to do it, he would never have the chance to uh, enact on his plan. He was arrested by Austria, 
He was exchanged with Polish revolutionaries and taken to Belgrade where he was executed. His last words were, I die today, but the seeds of freedom will be watered with my blood, according to the Austrian archives. The Filikia Deria was founded in 1814 in Odessa, in modern-day Ukraine, by three Greek merchants, Santhos, Sakalov, and Skufas. They were most like, all three of them were most likely Freemasons, uh, so they actually knew how to run a secret organization. The idea was to create a new Hellenic Republic, and by Greek they actually meant every Christian in the Balkans, similar to the idea of Rigas but without the Turks. Theoretically it was led by a non-existent supreme authority, strongly implied to be the Tsar, but it was not actually led by the Tsar. The supreme authority was fictional. From 1820, Prince Alexander Sipsilantis, his father had been the hospital of Bordo Wallachia, today we call it Romania, uh, became its leader. And began preparations in earnest for the Greek Revolution to begin. And the revolution was to be all over the Greek world. One important reason why the previous revolutions we had, 126 revolutions, Greek revolutions take place between 1453 and 1821 was that they were local. The Greek Revolution succeeded among other regions because it took place all over the Ottoman Empire. His plan was to revolt in Wallachia, it was called Romania a few decades later, the term, uh, basically take over the land, then cross through Bulgaria all the way to Constantinople and overturn the Sultan, and the people have been burned in the meantime. Now, uh, this is the only map I have, so let me explain a little bit of of Greece for those that actually are not particularly familiar. So this here is the Peloponnese, which was the cradle of the revolution. The island of Crete here. This is Rumeli, Thessaly, the islands of the Aegean. The Ionian islands at the time were under the control of Britain, they were a British protectorate. After, uh, Venice had been destroyed in the, in the Napoleon, lost its independence during the Napoleonic Wars. And over here is Macedonia and Thrace. Now, Mani, uh, which is uh, in this leg here of the Peloponnese, the middle one, and Tripolitza, is right in the middle of the Peloponnese. So, these are the flags of the revolution. We didn't have a Greek flag yet. So, they, uh, from when they would rise, and they would put up their own revolutionary flag for a revolution in 1821. So, the Greek Revolution can be, uh, is divided into three phase, phases. The first phase is the, break, is the breakout from 1821, which had both victories and defeats. To be honest, we lost more battles than we won between 1821 and 1824, but uh, and we did not get, uh, we got very little diplomatic recognition, but we managed to actually form a state. Unfortunately, this period ends with the two civil wars of the revolution, which were between 1823 and 1825. The second phase is 1824-2027, when Mohammed Ali of Egypt, uh, in exchange for getting the Peloponnese, sent help to the Sultan and the revolution got into a major crisis. That particular though, period ends with the Battle of Navarino, when the, three, when the fleet of uh, the United Kingdom, France and Russia, defeated the joint Turkish uh, and uh, Egyptian fleet, uh, leading eventually, though it took well over a year, to the formation of the independent Greek state. Also at the same period we had war between, uh, after Navarre, we also had war between the Russians and the Turks, and also there was, uh, the, the French sent an expedition in Greece. So, political leadership, believe it or not, your typical Greek student cannot name the Sultan at the time, who was Mahmoud II. And he had, and during that time period, he had nine grand viziers, that would be the equivalent of prime minister. On the Greek side, the political leadership, uh, they, they were called, they had various names, uh, Prokriti, Dimogeodes, Kotzabasi, Proestim, 
the, in the Greek terms of that actually meant they were the elders. The Turkish term meant the bitches. They were actually the lowest rank of Ottoman political leadership. They were uh, set up as leaders of uh, the Greeks, but they, they were not allowed to have any sort of leadership over the Turks, any sort of power. The Greek state eventually organized itself as a state with separation of power, legislative, executive, and judicial. Now, for the Progress team, the idea of the revolution was that at the end of the revolution that there would be a state that would be just like the Ottoman Empire, but they would be allowed to advance up the hierarchy. That was not though really what the Greeks, what the, the lower classes really wanted. Our military forces. Now, on the Greek side, we have the Kleftes and the Armatoli. Kleftis, which apparently in English is transliterated as cleft, actually means thief, though the more proper translation would be bandit. Ben. And when we're talking kleftis, uh, think of the thieves that were crucified to the left and right of Jesus. They were people that had, that yeah, you did not want to have an encounter with them. They were highwaymen. But on the other hand, they had an actual hate for the Ottoman leadership and they were outlaws. They were out living on the mountains and stealing because they had no other means of survival. Now, the Ottoman Empire up until Tanziman did not have an actual professional police force. They would simply take the strongest thief and they would make him armatolos, basically the police. Imagine if we took the strongest gang that we have in uh, Fresno, and we made them the police force. That's how the Ottoman Empire actually worked. On the Turkish side, it was also mostly fought through with irregular forces. On the one hand, we have the Sekban, who were from Anatolia, though they were not the majority of the forces that fought in the Greek Revolution. You see, in order to get into Europe from Anatolia, they had to actually take a boat, and we have control of the sea. The other part were Al Albanian irregulars who fought like the Greeks, but they had also experience into actually using a gun. At the end of the revolution, the only people who had actually got a gun among the rebels were the cleftes. Finally, uh, during the Egyptian intervention, the Egyptian troops had been organized and led by European officers, and they were fighting in the European way. And when they first landed at Methoni, you know, the Greeks were actually making fun of them. I will just pick them up. So they, made, they would go into battle, and then they actually defeat one of the sides. But because they were regulars, they did not flee, unlike the Turks. And instead, they held on and actually defeated us. And that was the revolution in crisis. Now, I want to read here from the memoirs of Kolokotronis. Kolokotronis was the leader of the revolution in the military leader of the revolution in the Peloponnese. We have some idea what the Greek irregular actually means. And also another note, uh, this is my translation and Kolokotronis does speak like that with a big run on. Most of the cleftes were semi-literate at best, as was Kolokotronis, or completely illiterate. They did speak like that. So the command of the Greek army was torture, because it had to be both the leader, the judge, and the caretaker, and yet see soldiers defect every day and return. To hope, we had to hold the account with lies, with flattery, with fairy tales. We were missing animal feed and ammunition. They wouldn't listen, they would be the Greek soldiers. And talk back to their leader. Well, in Europe, the commander-in-chief orders the general, the generals, the colonels, the colonels, the majors, and so on. He, he would be God, made his plan and saw it through. Wellington should give me 40,000 troops, meaning of his troops. I can command them, but give him 500 Greeks, and he couldn't command them even for an hour. Every Greek had his gift, and you had to deal with them. Another one you had to bully, another one you had to flatter, according to the people. So, at sea, we have what is, has gone on in history as the Three Island Fleet. The three islands are either Spetses and Psara. Either and Spetses are right off the Peloponnese, Psara, Psara is right off uh, the exit of, uh, the, of the Sea of Marmara. They were armed merchant ships, and throughout the battle we were outnumbered and outgunned. However, we had superior seamanship compared to the Turks, and that is very important. 
Now, the Turkish fleet was actually pretty modern, the ships on the line, but they had very little experience fighting pirates, and more importantly, 80% of the Turkish fleet was composed of Greek sailors, who had absolutely no intention of fighting against their brothers. If they had actually taken out their fleet, there was a strong possibility that uh, the fleet would actually mutiny and join our side. Which is why they had to fight with only the 20% of the fleet that was made of most from North Africans. Finally, the Egyptian fleet was modern, competent, and led by European admirals. They had the French admiral during our revolution. So, the Greek Revolution begins in Moldovalachia, which we today we call Romania. It was not yet called that. So, Ypsilantis, right here in the picture in the middle, crossed the river Prut in, on, on February 22nd, 1821, where he was joined over there by the Greek diaspora, living in Moldovalachia. There was and there is in Romania a major Greek community. More now, most famously, he was joined by the Greek college students of Europe who formed the Sacred Battalion, which was named after the Theban unit from antiquity. He was denounced by the Tsar, though. He actually made a proclamation to the Greeks claiming that a powerful force will come on your side. Well, the Tsar denounced him, saying that we are not that particular, and he also removed him from the Turkish, from the Russian army where he was an officer, and he actually put a price on his head. He did try to get the Romanians to actually revolt with us, but that didn't happen. You see, in 1815, Serbia is the first country that managed to break free from the Ottoman Empire. And what happened was, but they only got autonomy, not independence. What happened was that uh, after during the internal machinations at the, the supply gate, the Janissaries revolted. And the result was that uh, they forced uh, several laws on the Sultan. The Serbs rose against the Janissaries, and so the Sultan rewarded them with the limited autonomy. This is what the Romanians wanted as opposed to the Hellenic Republic, which was what Ypsilantis was offering. So he met the Romanian rebel leader Vladimir Escu. Vladimir Escu rejected him. Okay. So in the end, the battle was actually fought mostly by the Greek diaspora. So our major uh, battle during, that, during the revolution is the Battle of Dragasan on June 7th, 1821, where we were defeated by the Turkish forces. Ypsilantis himself uh, took after the battle of the sacred battalion, they died to the last person. I think one or two merchant people actually survived it, only to be executed afterwards. Ypsilantis himself uh, fled to Austria, uh, where he was imprisoned in Vienna. During his imprisonment, he contracted tuberculosis, and eventually he was released in 1828 after the Tsar press, and he spent the last 40 days of his life in the house of a very strict merchant of Vienna. That would be Alexander Sipsilandis. The last act of the revolution in Moldovalachia was when Georgios uh, Olympios, who had fled towards the, turf, towards the Russian border, when the Russians wouldn't allow him, after a battle, he blew out himself and those inside uh, that were fighting with him. However, after that, the Russians didn't allow the women and children to cross the Danube River into Russia. However, so the Greek Revolution failed in Moldovalachia. However, it was not a, ma a total failure because after that, the majority of the Turkish forces in Europe were actually gathered in Moldovalachia and they were not there to crush the revolution, to crush the revolution in Greece. So, the military thing in the Balkan was that Ali Pasha Tepel and Lim uh, had mutinied that by that point against the, against uh, the Sublime Gate, and he was being besieged by 80,000 troops in Ioannina from the summer of 1820 up to January 1822. That, along with what was happening in Moldovalachia, tied down the Turkish forces. Um, and in order to bring uh, Sebgan from Asia Minor, that required a control of the seas, which they did not have. Also, though it's not typically mentioned in Greek history books, there was a war between the Ottoman and the Persian Empire between 1821 and 1823. Now, between January 26 and 31st, Papa Flesas met the Prosti at Vostica, which today we call it Tegio, that's in the north side of the Peloponnese. Over there, 
they sent up the details of what's going to happen. After a couple of days, uh, they came to a conclusion. On March 25th, 1821, during the Feast of the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary, we're going, uh, the Peloponnese were going to rise against uh, the Turks. In practice, it didn't actually work like that because of the local circumstances. After all, or a little bit before Twitter, it took a time for communications to break through. <laughs> So, the Peloponnese in Eastern Rumboli rose in sometime between March 17th and April 15th. The rest of Greece, there were revolutions as late as May to June. Even afterwards there was a revolution. There we have the revolution of Varia now in Western Macedonia in 1822, and there is the second Cretan revolution in 1828. Now, I'm not going to be mentioning again that particular revolution, but let's just say that the Second Cretan Revolution eventually led to Greece's most famous ghost stories, the Drosulites, who are the ghosts of those who fought on that particular, in the last battle of that revolution. So, on March 25th, 1821, Paleo Patron Germanos, uh, Bishop of all Patras, that's what that means, this person over here, uh, came to the monastery of Megisti Larva in Calabria. He called the revolution and then um, he called the revolution and blessed the flag and the cleftes. By the, in the space of one week, the Greeks controlled the Peloponnesian countryside. However, we did not control the cities. Now, Golokotronis, who had a strategic mind, understood that in order to control the Peloponnese, you have to control Tripolitza which is today we call it Tripoli. It's located in the middle of the Peloponnese. Another thing to be aware, the last major Greek revolution was 51 years earlier, the Orlofica, when we heard the promises that Catherine, that, that, that Tsarina Catherine the Great gave us, and we rose against the Turks and for the Russians only to be sold out in the end. That particular revolution ended, which, was when, when, which happened when his mother was pregnant with him, it ended when the Turkish force uh, relieved the uh, Tripolitza and then crashed the rest of the revolution. So from early June, uh, Kolokotronis, begging others, lying to others, trading to others, managed to get Tripolitza besieged. Now in the Peloponnese there simply weren't that many Turks to, uh, to begin with, unlike other parts. So. Uh, it became obvious after a point that the police could not be uh, needed the relief. They could not actually defend against the rebels. And uh, the siege of the police is one of the important events of the Greek Revolution. Uh, after a point, they actually uh, before the revolution, because the Turks were uh, thinking of something, something might actually happen. They forced every major family to to send a representative inside the city. When the siege was going on, in order to break their morale, they would actually throw the, throw the relative out down the walls of uh, Tripolitza. But still that didn't break the morale. They would actually sort it out from the walls to attack the Greek troops. Uh, and several battles took place, including one at the village where our friend Kopi Soteropoulos comes from. That happened during the siege of Tripolitza. End result, though, it was becoming ever obvious that uh, the rebels were not going anywhere. So, we've had the very famous negotiations over there. So, Kolokotronis and several other representatives get in and they get asked, you know, you Greeks, you have been living so quiet so long, so many years in peace. Why did you raise now? And then Kolokotronis answered, when, the, when Constantinople fell, there was never any peace treaty. So, do you have an emperor? No, we don't have an emperor. But we are his soldiers. Uh, Mani, uh, Suli, Sfakia are our castles. Mani, Suli and Sfakia were parts of Greece that were never effectively controlled by the Ottoman Empire. And at that point it became obvious that, that they were not about to give up. But no uh, relief force was coming. I'll talk about that in the next uh, slide. So, the, um, and eventually, uh, the, and eventually, Tripolitza fell on September 23rd, 1821. Now, one thing that we nowadays have finally added to the history books is that the fall of Tripolitza was followed by was uh, followed by a major massacre. Very few of the Turks inside Tripolitza actually survived. Kolokotronis, uh, uh, a few days after uh, the fall of Tripolitza, rode his horse 
to cut down a maple tree where many of his family members had been executed over the centuries. He said that his horse never stepped on, a, on the ground, only on dead people. The last end in 1821 in the Peloponnese, actually in 1822, is the fall of Corinth on the 14th of January, 1822. Oh, oops, sorry. Oops. Sorry. Now, in Rumelin, the first to write was for Kiss on March 24th, uh, on March 24th. The, the first, uh, the, the Turks first a small detachment of about uh, 8,000 people from the force that was fighting Ali Pasha. Uh, that force first faced Athanasius Diakos in Alamana on April 22nd. And Alamana is very close to Thermopyla and in the end Athanasius Diakos gained the same glory as King Leonidas and his 300 Spartans 24 centuries earlier because he was caught and he was offered a high rank in the Ottoman army if he, was, if he converted to Islam. Athanasius the Argos refused and he said his famous quotation, I was born a Greek, I want to die a Greek. However, the ragged defense of the Greeks actually troubled Omer Vrionis. So he did not, and he was, and after that he was actually, he was killed by being skewered alive. Yep. Explain that Diakos means... actually means Digon. Athanasius Diakos was actually originally a, both a monk and a priest, and he was forced at the age of 17 to become a cleft. So he was actually skewered, at the, he was actually skewered at, uh, after the battle of, um, after the battle of Alamana. However, the Omer Fironis saw that he had lost too many soldiers and he did not advance. Uh, he was faced slightly southwards at the Hani of Ravia, the Battle of Ravia Inn, that's what Hani means an inn, on, uh, on, the August, on uh, May 8, 1821, by a force led by Odysseus and Durtus, leading to a major defeat. At that point, uh, Omer Vrionis asked uh, Constantinople for extra help, so a second force was dispatched from Constantinople. That second force, first of all, they took down the revolution in Thrace, in the village of Saltitio, which today we call Lavara. Uh, the, Greek, uh, the Greek villagers living there, that's on the Evros River, near the modern Greek-Turkish border. They were defeated and many of them were killed. Then that particular force crashed the revolution in Halkendiki. Uh, first, uh, first they hit Thessaloniki and they killed tens of thousands of Greeks inside Thessaloniki. Before 1821, Thessaloniki had a majority Greek population. After 1821, for the rest of the 19th century, it had a majority Jewish population because so many Greeks had been killed. He, he crashed the revolution in Halkendiki. He went down Greece. And then uh, he, actually, he drove back the rebels in, Thess in Thessaly towards uh, uh, Magnesia. And eventually uh, he reached Vasilika. In the Battle of Vasilika, though, Odysseus and Drutus defeated him on August 26th. That was the point that meant that no force was to come to the Peloponnese. And that is why one month later Tripolitza fell. Now, on the islands, now the, Greek, uh, the Greeks had become pretty, the Greek ship owners had become pretty wealthy, breaking the embargoes, the counter embargoes of the Napoleonic Wars. So the ship owners were rather content being inside the Ottoman Empire, at least many of them. That was not true though of their crew. Their crew, uh, so the crew wanted to rebel. So in many cases there was an internal coup that led to the, to the island joining the revolution. The first island to rise was, uh, was Petsis on April 2nd. They were led by Ascarina Bubulina, who is the most important woman of the Greek Revolution. By May, most islands had similarly risen. The major sea event during the first year of the Greek Revolution is the burning of a two-decker ship in Eresos. Eresos is located in the island of Lesbos. Now, that particular ship had been uh, had been isolated inside the Eresos, but uh, the rebels who had much smaller ships had no idea how to destroy it. Their cannons were not powerful enough, 
And this is the first use of the fireboat. Now a fireboat, to get some idea what we're talking about, imagine a ship that is filled over the top with uh, gunpowder. Whenever a fireboat was actually sent to fight, uh, basically the process begin with the sailors uh, giving uh, final, giving confession and receiving Holy Communion over land. It was basically similar to a suicide bomb. You got to be super brave to ride a, a, a fireboat. The Turks, though, took out their frustration for uh, the burning of that ship by burning down the city of Kidonias in Asia Minor and killing the people, even though Kidonias did not have a significant, had nothing to do with the revolution. Now, for the rest of 1821, what typically happened in the rest of Greece was that the rebel ship would sail in and the local Greeks would rise only to be crushed by the local Turks. So in Greek Revolution began on April, on April 7, 1821, and it lasted three years. Now, Crete at the time had a very large Turkish population, that's why unlike the Peloponnese, uh, it was pretty ba balanced all, all the way. We did not have major successes until eventually Ibrahim came in in 1824 and crushed the revolution. Pilion, as I mentioned earlier, in Thessaly rose on May 4th and was crushed by the force coming down. In Galkidiki, the revolution of Macedonia already mentioned, and the members of the Philikia, they actually landed on June 9th, uh, hoping to get Cyprus to rise. However, the Turks simply killed the, the, the prominent Greeks on, in the massacre of Nicosia on, July, on the 9th of July, 1821. So Cyprus did not rise, but they did send Cyprus volunteers in, the, in Greece. Now, I've already alluded to that. So, the Greek Orthodox Church was an Israel by the Ecumenical Patriarch who is in Constantinople, this, uh, who was at the time also, among other things, a dignitary of the Ottoman state. Despite having denounced the revolution at the behest of the Sultan Mahmoud, uh, the Sultan Mahmoud incited the crowd and uh, the Patriarch Gregory V was lynched on Easter Sunday, April 10th, and during the service of Agape, during the service of love. A Greek ship, uh, he was hanged at the beautiful gate of uh, the Patriarch at Infanari and he was decapitated and his body and head were thrown to the sea. A Greek ship though did manage to bring his headless body to Russia and buried it in Odessa. And that is actually a critical point because that's the point where Russia Turn towards our side because the Russian public, uh, the Greek Orthodox world, Greek Orthodoxy, is also the official religion of, the, of Russia. So uh, the people who are actually incensed, the Russian people that had, had killed the leader of the Orthodox Church. So, and you know, when Russia was an autocracy, but in the end, you know, even the autocracy can't really go all the time against his people. So this is the point where Russia turned, this led to diplomatic uh, tension and the result being that that's what kept the Turkish army in Moldovalachia stationed there instead of being sent, in, sent down. There were at least 22 known large-scale massacres of Greeks between April and June 1821. And several of those, they've continued, we had both later such massacres like that, in, like in Samothraki and in later years. In the West, though, our revolution was much better received than it was received by the, by the Turks. Generally, at the beginning at least, the people in the West embraced it. The governments, not so much. You see, in the 18th century, during the Age of Enlightenment, Greece was, uh, was uh, uh, being advertised by the, uh, by the intellectuals as a model of a state that can work as ancient Greece. Athens, a state that can actually work without the king and work very well for that matter. The 19th century, from the French Revolution on, is the age of Romanticism. And the Romanticism means uh, brought two forces out front. One of them was liberalism and the other was nationalism. So the Romantic rebels of the 19th century actually saw another uh, revolution just like the one they had fought on. That's why we actually received a large number of foreign volunteers in our revolution, kind of like how today Ukraine is receiving volunteers in their fight against Russia. 
However, as I said, the governments did not like at first our revolution. In the Congress of Leibach, which took place on August 4, 1821, the Austrian uh, Chancellor Metternich, who was uh, the leader of the conservative forces in Europe, proposed sending troops to quell the revolution for the Turks. Kapodistrias, who at that time was the foreign minister of Russia, actually stopped him, but accepted that they could send Austrian troops to crush the revolution taking place at the same time in southern Italy. Now, the other major thing that took place in 1821 is the Greek First uh, National Assembly. There were several other national assemblies, but this is the only one I will talk about. The National Assembly took place in the village of Nea Epidagos, as it was called. At the end of the revolution, they seemed, at the end of the assembly, renamed it from Piadia to Nea Epidagos. It's a village in the eastern Peloponnese in Argolis that is, that is on a mountain and close to the sea, but it's not uh, too close to the sea, so, the, so that in case any force came by sea, they could scatter. And, uh, but on the other hand, it's also not uh, very close, and uh, not very easy to arrive by land, so that in case the Turks broke through, they could also scatter back to their homes. Now, since it is a village, there was no building big enough to hold all the delegates, so the, so the National Assembly actually took place in the central square in the middle of winter in a cold winter, for that matter. The first National Assembly was called in Epidavros by Dimitrios Sipsilandis, brother of Alexander Sipsilandis, who was in Moldovalachia, when it became obvious that it would only be the Greeks that rose in rebellion against the Turks. So obviously, the dream of the Philikia Eteria would not work, so they had to decide what was the Greek Revolution about. So, what came out of the First National Assembly? First of all, is our Declaration of Independence on January 1st, 1822. The Declaration of Independence is basically one paragraph. You know, the American Declaration of Independence is a very important document for the Age of Enlightenment. Greek Revolution, the Greek Declaration of Independence, not so much. It just says that, we, that uh, having suffered centuries under the Ottoman and the unjust Ottoman yoke, with the Greek nation declares its political existence and independence. Afterward follows the Declaration of Epidavros, which is the continuation of the Declaration of Independence. Basically, the Declaration of Epidavros repeats one word over and over, aftheresia, which is translated arbitrariness. It says that since so many centuries under the Turks, we lived uh, in a regime where that was full of arbitrariness. Whatever the local uh, dignitary, the local Turk wanted, they could just force on us. And we are now going to create a Greek state that will be based on laws, not on the whatever the, lo whatever the local big wig wants. <laughs> Other stuff, first of all, they declared that the laws of our beloved emperors of blessed memory, those would be the Byzantine emperors, will always be in effect. Now, that meant in practice uh, two things. First of all, that Greece would be a civil law uh, country, like, say, France, and unlike the US, which is a common law country. The second thing was that in practice, uh, the church had, under the Ottoman Empire, uh, privileges, uh, which meant, which included uh, having courts and resolving disputes. And they used Byzantine law for that by declaring that the Byzantine law would continue up until it was replaced, we basically continued using the Byzantine law, so there was no change in the legal regime of Greece. Finally, we have... Yeah, excuse me. Our first constitution, which was called the Temporary Constitution of Epidavros. Our constitution, first of all, abolished slavery. And this was actually used. We did have one black American slave, runaway slave from Baltimore who came and fought for a revolution because this was one of the few places where slaves were allowed to live and become free. Also, the Constitution of Greece. Yeah. Gave the right to vote to all male Christians. Uh, the Christian part was actually dropped in the second constitution. So every, and eventually the male part too, every Greek has a right to vote. In 1821, this was very radical. In the United States, 
if you were not if you were living in one of the territories you did not have a right to vote all and in britain maybe five percent of the population had a right to vote at the time we were the first country to, ex to extend the franchise that much now after the first after the first uh, national assembly we've had the second national assembly the third national assembly we've had the fourth national assembly which belongs to the age of couple of Istrias. And after Kapodistria was assassinated, we have two competing national assemblies. There is the fifth national assembly by those who were with Kapodistria, and the competing fourth national assembly by repetition, which took place at the same time by the others, by a group who were against Kapodistria. <coughs> now, in 1822, the Turkish fleet first exited the Straits on the 24th of January. They did manage to make it all the way to Patra, in the Peloponnese. They landed 4,000 people, but they were defeated at sea in the Battle of Patra on February 20th. The island of Chios rose in revolution in early March. By March 30th, the massacre of Chios, also known as the Holocaust of Chios, followed. 42,000 people of Chios were killed and 52,000 were sold as slaves. According to my family lore, one of my great-great-great-grandmothers was actually sold as a slave at the massacre of Hios. She was sold in Prusa in Bithynia, where my great-great-great-great-grandfather uh, liberated and eventually uh, married her. Uh, but, but to see this as uh, the possibility of what uh, the Greeks that could not actually rise in revolution could do, they, all they could really do was basically offer some relief for those that had suffered. However, the, the massacre of Hios shook Europe because Hios was a prosperous island and actually had sent one of its most important people, Adamantius Corais, was living in Paris. This is a painting by the French uh, artist Eugène de la Croix, uh, which is called The Massacre of Hios and is located right now in the Louvre. However, the, ma the massacre of Hios was avenged by Constantinos Canaris. At the time, he was 22, and he used and he used a fire boat to burn the Turkish flagship that was uh, that was stationed at the port of Hios on June 6th, becoming a hero overnight. The other major event uh, was the battle. Uh, it was the Battle of Spetses on September 8th, which led to the liberation of the city of Nafplio, which afterwards became the capital of uh, Greece, and the Battle of Tenedos on October 28th, when the Turkish street tried to get out again, was stopped at Tenedos. At land, as I mentioned earlier, the revolution broke out at very in 1822, which unfortunately failed very rapidly. Uh, it lasted only two months. The end result was that the last, after the men were defeated, the last women actually gathered in Edessa at their, uh, what's cataract, how do we call it cataract? At the waterfall, and they jumped off uh, the waterfall over there rather than fall to the Turks. They took their children and hardly jumped off the waterfall rather than fall to the Turks. Now, on the, on the 7th of April, we have the disaster of Peta. Basically, a Greek regular force tried to move north from Mesologi to liberate the to liberate Epirus and was destroyed completely at Peta. The major the major event though on the on 1822 is the campaign of Dramalis. Dramalis set out in uh, June with the army that had defeated Ali Pasat the Pelemli to crush the Greek Revolution. He did not face resistance while crossing Rumeli because the force that he was coming with was about 10 times the size of the force that had been defeated on the previous year at the Khani of Ravian. So he, went, he, went, he entered all the way to Corinth and then yes, they entered the Peloponnese. However, there he faced the strategic genius of Kolokotronis. Kolokotronis understood that an arm, as, as Napoleon said, an army marches on his stomach. So when he was also, the Ramalist made a major mistake with the benefit of hindsight. He did not leave a force behind to keep the, to keep the passes open. End result, 
uh, his, an entire force entered Argolis. Kolokotronis blocked all the exits from the plain of Argolis. He burned all the he burned all the crops and he poisoned the wells. And uh, we had control of the sea, so no force could come over land, could come over water. And Dramalis was trapped in the plain of Argolis in the middle of the Greek summer. He tried to get out, and over there his force was massacred. Um, it was in the Battle of Dervenakia on July 26th, uh, which uh, with none of them actually made it back over to, uh, to Constantinople. Also in 1822, we have the first siege of Mesologi between the 25th of October and the 31st of December. In 1823, we did not have major campaigns. Uh, in Crete, there was a victory at Selino in June, but there was a defeat in the Battle of Amur, Yeles, in August. Uh, the Turks did send two forces, one down the east side of Greece and down, one down the west side. The west campaign ended with the second siege of Mesologi, which failed. The east campaign was defeated outside Athens and then marched into Evia. The more important thing that happened in 1823 was actually happened in Whitehall, in London. George Canning became the Foreign Secretary of Britain. And that meant that Britain actually changed from hostile to friendly towards our side, as long as Canning was in power. The, since the revolution was not facing major threats, immediate threats, uh, the end result was the Greek civil, we had at that point the two Greek civil wars. The proximate cause of the Greek civil wars was uh, the two revolutionary loans. Now, during the revolution, we actually received two loans uh, that were raised in London. Uh, those two loans have been denied at the beginning of the Greek public debt, and to be honest, we did not actually manage to repay them immediately, and that is actually our first, the first bankruptcy of Greece. Uh, the, one that actually, the one that happened about a decade ago and led me to come here to the United States, that was our seventh bankruptcy. And now, and if you think that Congress, that things are pretty bad with how money would, spend, would be spent, let's just say that in Greece, over how to spend the money, we've got the civil wars. The first civil war in 1823-24 is between the political and the military leaders. The political leader war, unfortunately, and they imprisoned all the, all the military leaders. In the second civil war is between the islands and the people of Rumeli versus the Peloponnesians. The Pelo at, the end of the, at the end of the civil war, the Peloponnesians were imprisoned. And, 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 you know, at least those in prison were actually alive. Too many competent leaders died uh, from Greek hands. The important part, though, was that while we were fighting each other, the Sultan came in agreement with Mohammed Ali of Egypt to, to actually send his force in exchange for territory under his rule. Specifically, the Peloponnese was to become under his son Ibrahim. Crete was to become part of Egypt, that was the island of Thassos. So in 1824, Ibrahim took his force to sea. Now the other thing that happened in 1824 is that France also turned to our side and became friendly. A Turkish land invasion from the, the Turks did try to cooperate, but so they actually lost the land invasion from the north, which failed at, uh, at Ambliani, which is in Fokis. Fokis is uh, in, the, in, the, in Rumeli. Ibrahim first landed in Crete. They, no force came to help the Cretans because we were fighting the civil war. So he crashed the revolution over there. Then he moved on to Kassos. Kassos is an island in, the, in southern Greece. At the same time, the fleet, the Turkish fleet came out of the straits and landed in Psara. Both uh, islands were destroyed. The fleets of Psara, Idra and Spetses were not coming out because the ship owners wanted uh, we're waiting for money to be sent, money that we didn't have. So, eventually, though, after the destruction of Sarah, the ship owners actually spent their own money on the crew. And the fleet did come out, and we have the largest uh, victory we've had during the war. Uh, the Battle of Yer, where Nyaul is this person over here, he managed to sink 22 Turkish and Egyptian fleet and saved, uh, the, and saved the island of uh, Samos from being invaded. 
After Ibrahim took over the Pelopo uh, took over Crete, he used as his base to invade the Peloponnese. Now it was now it were not entirely sure to this very day, but what has but there was a plan called the if it was true, but there was a plan called the barbarization project. The idea was to kill the Greeks of the Peloponnese and replace them with Egyptians. We're not entirely sure if it was true, but it was certain that it led the, it was received very badly in the West, especially by Stratford Canning. Ibrahim landed in Methoni on February 24th. And at that point, Greece was being led by its third prime minister, Kuduriotis. Kuduriotis was a great seaman, but he had no idea how to lead at land, to the point that when he couldn't even ride a horse, he had two servants holding his horse. Now, he did have pretty competent military leaders next to him, but he didn't want to appoint somebody else as leader of the army, because that would actually, that would possibly tarnish his star as prime minister. And the result was the defeat at Methoni. And then he was deposed from prime minister. Papa Flesas, who had uh, opened the revolution with the uh, uh, with uh, uh, with Advoni Jam in uh, with uh, he was he was minister of the interior. He allowed all of the Peloponnesian prisoners out of the civil war, and he uh, took camp at Maniaki. However, the Peloponnesians did not come to help him at Maniaki, and he was killed heroically in the Battle of Maniaki. The revolution seemed to be collapsing at that point, and it was saved by General Yanis Makriyanis in the Battle of Mili, which is outside Navplio. The Battle of Mili, if we as any Greek student will tell you, is actually pretty famous. Because at that point, there was, uh, because uh, Makriyanis had uh, a discussion with the French Admiral de Rigny. De Rigny told Makriyanis, right now your position is very weak, you're going to get crushed. And Makriyanis answered, you know, since the beginning of time, all kinds of monsters have been trying to eat the Greeks. And yes, they bite the pit or piece of us, but we are still around, and yeast is still left. And yes, our position is weak, but powerful is the God that protects us. And with the help of God, we're going to win the revolution. And that's actually what happened. Makriyanis did save uh, the, at the Battle of Mil. Now, in the, in, the, in the period of this crisis, we actually offered the act of submission to Britain in 18, on July 1825. We actually offered to become a British colony in exchange uh, for them defeating the Turks, the British, as, as, were the, as were the Ionian Islands. The British actually rejected it. Ibrahim, seeing that he could not bring down the revolution, he decided to cross over to Mesologi in December. On the way to Mesolonghi, he destroyed the northwestern Peloponnese. The siege of Mesolonghi is one of the most heroic acts of the Greek Revolution. It took the third siege. It took place between April 15, 1825 and April 10, 1826. Now, Mesolonghi, they had built several ramparts. One of those ramparts was actually named after Benjamin Franklin. They were named after many famous revolutionaries. We were actually winning the battle of the ramparts. And at the beginning, Miaulis did manage to resupply us over water. Unfortunately, after the island of Vasiliadi fell to Ibrahim on, the third, on March 9, 1826, that blocked our uh, air supply. Running out of food, the Greeks decided that they would, lie, they would try to sort the city instead of surrendering. That was set for Palm Sunday on April 10th, 1826. Unfortunately, the sortie for the most part failed. It was supposed to take place into three waves, but the plan had been betrayed to Ibrahim. The first and the second wave did manage to come out, but the third wave, it was, uh, people started getting behind, behind, the Turks were ready, and they actually uh, fell on them. What happened afterwards was that the men were killed or sold as slaves and the women were given as playthings to the Egyptian soldiers. As happened right now when uh, to the Kurdish women, what ISIS did to the Kurdish women. The siege of Mesologi is uh, the moral center of the Greek Revolution. 
the use of the sword of Mesologi shook Europe because at the time typically cities surrendered, the people did not try to exit out. And it led directly to military intervention. The European public opinion demanded that the force come and stop the Turks. Now, this is our national poet, Dionysio Solomos, who was from Zakynthos. He actually published the hymn to liberty, which is our national anthem, inside B.C.'s Mesologi. It was adopted in 1862. His magnus opus, though, is Eleftheria Perochimene, free B.C.'s, which unfortunately he never managed to complete. And uh, the, the, they are free B.C.'s, because despite the fact that they are besieged, they cannot get out, they are free because they are refusing to surrender. Also, Mesologi, though, is not an important event just for Greek history. In Italy, especially before their unification, if they didn't want to have a problem with the Austrian censorship, they would typically write some romance about doom lovers set during the siege of Mesologi. And everybody knew what they were actually talking about. As I said, the now, the season of Mesologi should have ended the revolution, but it did not because of this man, Georgios Karaiskakis. Georgios Karaiskakis is known as the son of the nun. He was born in a monastery and he actually knew how to read and write, unlike most cleftes. The other, the, the other major thing that happened in 1826 uh, is the auspicious incident. The Sultan, having seen that the Janissaries were doing nothing, he basically massacred them in, in Constantinople, and then for several weeks the Bosporus was red with their blood. But typically we don't put them in history of the Greek Force, but it's important to understand how it went. Also, uh, Ibrahim, after returning from the, into the Peloponnese, he tried to take over Mali, and he failed, especially in the Battle of the Ross, it was actually fought by the women of Mani, who had absolutely no intention of happening to them, but happened to the women of Mesologi. Now, after the fall of Mesologi, Kutahis uh, marched towards Athens, and uh, Ibrahim returned to the Peloponnese. Uh, Kutahis, uh, but at the same time, Georgios Karaiskakis, the son of the nun, uh, was uh, chosen as the commander-in-chief in, in Rumeli. In, he, we're talking about a person that in 1821 changed sides four times between the rebels and the Turks in exchange for becoming the Armatolos of Aldos. But by 1826 he understood that the revolution had to win. So he went to this campaign even though he was actually sick with fever and he was being carried on a pallet. At the end of the revolution, all of Rumeli had been liberated with the exception of Mesologi, Nafpaktos, and Volitsa. Kutahius, though, kept besieging Athens, so Karaiskakis uh, gave him battle trying to relieve the city of Athens, where he was killed in the Battle of Anatos on April 23, 1827. And he was killed by a bullet that came from the Greek side. He was pretty certain, now it took three days for him to die, he was pretty certain that it was not, that the friendly fire incident was on purpose, that it was some political enemy of his. You know, 200 years later, we don't have any idea either way if it was something intentional or accidental. Athens unfortunately fell on May 25, 1827, but that proved to be the last Turkish success of the Greek Revolution. As I mentioned earlier, Britain, France, and Russia decided to send a peacekeeping force in Greece to force peace. So they actually came to Greece and uh, forced both the Turkish, the Egyptian, and the Greek fleet to end hostilities. They were not here to fight our battle. However, what exactly were the decisions, even 200 years later, we're not entirely sure. We know for sure that the French admiral that was leading the Egyptian fleet called in sick and refused to lead his own battle. Now, both sides tried to flee from a storm in the Bay of Navarino on October 20th, 1827. Due to a random event, battle began. At the end of the battle, the Turkish-Egyptian fleet was sunk at the bottom of Navarino 
On the other hand, the joint French, uh, British and Russian fleet, uh, they did not have any losses of ships. Now, of the three admirals, the, the Russian admiral von Eidek was honored by uh, the Tsar and there was major celebration in Russia. The French admiral uh, de Rigny was honored by the French since, it was, uh, since the French have not been very good at sea. The second to last victory at sea was the battle of the, was the, battle of the Chesapeake Bay during the American Revolution, the lost post of the battles during the Napoleonic Wars. But the British Admiral Codrington, who had the overall command, he was actually punished by his Prime Minister. And when, uh, the, and when the Tsar heard that, he sent him both money and honors. However, at the time also, the most important Greek leader of the Greek Revolution came. Ioannis Kapodistrias is the sort of person who that nations get only once in a long while. At the age of 26, he was, lead, he was leading the Ionian state, which was at the time a protectorate of Britain. He was elected as governor of Greece by the Third National Convention on March 30th, 1827, but he took some nine months until he actually arrived in Greece after Navarino. We are talking about the person, he found Greece very bankrupt and he spent his entire fortune a family fortune to save the revolution and his family and all of his energy. He was the sort of person that was chosen in order to make Greece a Western state. Unfortunately, uh, you know, that brought uh, reactions from the people who wanted Greece to become more of a continuation of the Ottoman Empire, but with Greeks on top. And that was the reason why he was assassinated. He did create a mass, he didn't give a massive effort to create the institution of a modern functioning state. He had the support of the masses, but he created many enemies among the property. Because you see, uh, in the United States there is a feeling that, you know, we want here, we don't want Washington running as we want control to be here. However, as we have learned in Greece, if you give all power locally, then the end result at times that your local big will become the local tyrant. And we actually want the central government to keep local government in control. Well, the local big wigs obviously didn't like him for that. Now, the other thing that took place after the Battle of Navarino is the Russian-Turkish War of 1828-29. Now, there was no certain that the war would break out, but uh, Wellington, the man who had won at Waterloo, was foreign minister of Britain. He apologized to the Sultan for the Battle of Waterloo, for the, for the Battle of Navarino, sorry. The Sultan took it as a sign to keep on fighting, but also to stop respecting Serbian autonomy. So Russia declared war, demanding that Serbian autonomy be restored. It was fought on two fronts. On the Balkan front, while well, Romania was easily taken, then Bulgaria was invaded. They were pushed back, invaded again, and then the battle ended at uh, Adrianople, where the peace treaty was signed, which forced the Sultan to accept Greek autonomy in addition to Serbian autonomy and Romanian autonomy. The other side was on the Caucasus front, when the Russians uh, had several victories in Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, which at that point became part of the Russian Empire. As I said, the Battle of Navarino did not mean the return, uh, the, uh, did not mean the end of the revolution. We had another year of battle against Ibrahim. After the Battle of Navarino, the King of France sent a force under Maison that liberated the Peloponnese. Because uh, at that point, uh, the, uh, the Turks were controlling only a few castles in the Peloponnese. The reason why the, they actually gave up was that Maison guaranteed that if they were to surrender, they would not get massacred by the Greeks. And that is how, that is why the point where the Turks actually surrendered their castles they were controlling. Now, since there, was, since there was that peacekeeping force, we could not actually go out and campaign. Uh, so, Kapodistrias would send an uh, army navy force to liberate the cities at Rumeli as a fait accompli. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this was the point where the Turks had uh, actually recruited quite a large number of Albanians that they were not paying them. 
So basically the Greek force would appear and offer them to surrender. At that point the, the Albanian troops would accept and the city would be liberated. Capodistrias, after a year of fighting, convinced the British to sign the Treaty of Alexandria with Ibrahim, after which Ibrahim left the Peloponnese on October 1st, 1828. Now, the, the Egyptians might have given up, but the Turks did not give up. So, uh, and, and the la so the Sultan sent the last force uh, to actually try to crush the revolution. It was defeated by Dimitrios Ypsilantis in the Battle of Petra on September 12, 1829, thus ending the war. So, by that time the war had ended, but they, and we were negotiating on what would be the borders of the Greek state. Also, whether the Greek state would be an autonomous or an independent state. Uh, eventually, under the Protocol of London, Greece became an independent state, and under the Treaty of Constantinople, it took the large border. This was the, the area in question that was being debated if Greece if it would become a part of Greece or not. As I mentioned earlier, Kapodistrias uh, broke a lot of... Um, Kapodistrias made many enemies. He was assassinated, for this reason, he was assassinated at the Church of St. Spirito in Afplio by, by Constantinos and Georgios Mavromichalis, uncle and nephew, on the 27th of September, 1831. And uh, the reason why he was assassinated was that he had arrested uh, the, he, the father and brother Mavromichalis because Mavromichalis wanted to create his own personal, uh, his own personal toll and actually import without paying, uh, we import goods into Greece without taxing the, the taxes. After the assassination of Kapodistrias, of Iranis Kapodistrias, he was replaced as head by his brother, August, as head of state by, by his brother Augustinos, but most of state authority collapsed. Armed guards started ruling Greece, and we became in a situation like uh, the way that Haiti is right now. It was very unsafe to be in Greece at the same time. So, now, however, the great powers had decided that Greece was to become a kingdom under King Otto, who was the second son of the King of Bavaria. Why? So, on the 25th of January, 1833, King Otto landed in Nathplio. The Greeks who had been tired of the chaos accepted him very willingly. And this is one of the statues, this is one of the paintings that, of, that, of, uh, the, of the landing of King Otto. Now another thing I want to note here is that little boy over here, that is Theodoros de Liliagis, who was to become the Prime Minister of Greece between 1885 and 1905. Basically it took another 60 years until, the, for the next 60 years, the Greek state was ruled by those who had fought in the revolution. And with this, I conclude today my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Um, uh, thank you for being here. I will have, we'll have a Q&A question, but first of all, I'll let you go to the bathroom. <laughs> it's not great.